So let's see how this goes. So, guys, we're going to be talking about the gospel of John and the mysteries within. There's so many details in the gospel of John. So many details, so many uh, uh, points being brought forth in the gospel of John. And there's so, there's so many mysteries even within the gospel of John itself. Uh, for my personally, that's one of, one of my favorite gospels, all right, to, to read. Because it's... It, it brings so much information and detail about while Christ was walking among with his disciples. So what we're going to talk about here is, is, is these mysteries we're talking about, more specifically, who is the beloved of Christ? Who is the beloved of Christ? We're going to be talking about these scenarios here, right? Um, and I'm going to give some evidence, and y'all decide on based off of what the evidence that brought forth. Who do you believe is the, is the beloved of Christ, right? There's a lot of information out there will tell you. They'll give you different information, um, different uh, people, and say this is the, actually the uh, beloved of Christ. But we're going to go based off the evidence in the gospel, without any shadow of doubt, who is the beloved of Christ. So we're going to talk about that. All right. Before we start, let's read St. John chapter 21, verse 24. This is, the, this is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. So, okay. So, automatically, if a person sees the gospel of John, it's naturally that somebody's going to say, hey, who wrote it and who testimony it is John, correct? But based off of the, on the last chapter of John, chapter 21, verse 24, in the book of the Gospel of John, John is saying, this is the disciple which testified of these things and wrote these things. And we showing that there's a group of people who John is hanging out with, saying we know that his testimony is true. We know that his testimony is true. Right? So again, it's naturally for somebody to say, okay, yes, it's John. And yes, there's other details and information as well going to show you that it's John. But let's see if it's, is that truly what it, is, what it is, right? All right, so let's go into the church father's understanding of who is the beloved disciple in the Gospel of John, right? And anybody don't know who, the, uh, who they call the church fathers or these are the disciples of the dis disciples of the disciples, some of them, or some of them say that they came out straight from the teaching of certain apostles. So they're going to tell you what information that they receive concerning who is the beloved disciple, right? So we're going to get all this information. Some of them are from first century. Some of them are from second century. Some of them say that they were just right there, close to after, during Paul and Peter. But we're going to see all this information here, right? So let's read it. All right, so first, the first one we're going to look at is Eusebius, right? Eusebius says he's, he has the information concerning who is the beloved of Christ. So let's read that. Verse 1, but the bishops of Asia, led by Polycrates, decided to hold to the old custom handed down to them. Mm -hmm. He himself, in a letter which he addressed to Victor and the Church of Rome, set forth in the following words of the tradition which had come down to him. Verse 2, we observe... We observe that exact day, neither adding nor taking away, for in Asia also great lights have fallen asleep, which shall rise again on the day of the Lord's coming, when he shall come with glory from heaven and shall seek out all the saints. Among these are Philip, one of the twelve apostles, who fell asleep in Hierapolis, and his two aged virgin daughters, and another daughter, who lived in the Holy Spirit and now rests, and Eusephus, and moreover John, who had both a witness and a teacher, 
who reclined upon the bosom of the Lord and being a priest wore the sacerdotal plate. He fell asleep and Euphesus. Right, so Eusebius now is saying that John is both the witness and a teacher who reclined upon the bosom of the Lord and being a priest. This is what Eusebius is saying. That John was the one who rested his head on, on Christ's bosom. Not only that he not only he did that, he was a priest. And not only that, he was the witness, according to the gospel of John. Keep that in mind. Let's go to the next slide. Now let's, let's talk about Irenaeus now. All right, 202 AD, right? One, it says 115 to 202 AD. Let's see what he has to say, right? Irenaeus, let's read. He is a rich source of Christian traditions. He was the Bishop of Lyons, France. As a boy, he knew Polycarp personally, was a disciple of John and the Apostle and other Apostles, became the Bishop of Smyrna, and was mar and martyred when he was 86 years old. So, so now he's saying that, Arrhenius is saying that these set of people, Polycarp was a disciple of John. This is what Irenaeus is saying. That Polycarp was a disciple of John. Right? Let's continue. Let's read that. Continue. Possibly drawing from sources in addition to Polycarp and his community. Irenaeus affirms that John, the disciple who leaned on Yeshia's chest during the Last Supper, published the gospel. So now... Irenaeus is now saying that he affirms that John, the disciple who was leaning on Yeshua's chest during the Last Supper. This is what Irenaeus is saying. Being the disciple of Polycarp, who's saying that Polycarp is saying that he was a disciple of John. Based off of that information, what Irenaeus is saying. Right? Continue. Irenaeus matter-of-factly names John, disciple of the Lord, or just John, and then quotes from the gospel in Against Heresies. All right, so let's, go, let's read what it says Against Heresies, book 3, chapter 1. Let's read what it says there. Matthew also issued a written gospel among the Hebrews in their own dialect. So just let you know that the gospel of Matthew was originally written in Hebrew, right? It was originally written in Hebrew, that particular gospel, that particular writing is lost, or maybe in the Vatican's closet somewhere, right? But we cannot find the, 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 the Hebrew gospel of Matthew, right? The Hebrew version of the Matthew, right? It was written in, the, in, in, our, in our Hebrew own dialect, right? Continue. While Peter, while Peter and Paul were preaching at Rome That's and the, laying the no, There's no information on that, but go ahead, continue preaching at Rome and laying the foundations of the church. Mm -hmm. After their departure, Mark, the disciple and interpreter of Peter, did also hand down to us in writing what had been preached by Peter. Mm -hmm. Luke, also the companion of Paul, recorded in a book the gospel preached by him. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, John, the disciple of the Lord, who also had leaned upon his breast and did himself publish a gospel during his residence at Ephesus in Asia. So, right. So, everybody's saying, Irenaeus, Eusebius, are now saying, and even Polycarp, who, was the disciple, who said that he was a disciple of John, are all saying that this is he who laid his head on Christ's bosom. All right? Keep that in mind. What about, let's go back. Let's use the arrows. What about Tertullian? Let's see what Tortillian said. This is from 100, 100, uh, 160 AD to 250 AD. Let's read what Tortillian has to say. He was an apologist who wrote in Latin. He is known as the founder of Latin Christianity, specifically the North African Latin Christian Christianity. Mm -hmm. He says in the context of discussing apostles that John wrote the gospel. Three chapters later, he says that the gospel of John was recognized by the apostolic church. Mm -hmm. In the same work, he matter-of-factly says the gospel of John and then quotes from it. He, 
at the bottom. Mm -hmm. He also says in the discussion on the apostles that John was the disciple whom Yeshia loved, who, who leaned on Yeshia's chest, uh -huh. and to whom Yeshia commended his mother. Right. So now Tortillian now is saying, based off of his information, that John again. John, again, is the beloved of Christ, the one who lay, laid on Christ's chest at the Last Supper, and the one that Christ said, Behold, here's my mother. Behold, here's your mother. This is what all these, who they call church fathers, are saying. But I'm going to tell you that I have a different view on based off what the gospel is saying, who is the beloved of Christ? Which I'm going to show you those evidence. Right? So we're going to see if these church fathers are actually saying the right thing based off of the gospel. You would think, oh, you would think, hey, based off of, based off of uh, their closeness being a hundred, uh, close to 100 years ago, 90-something years ago, that it will be good that it would be legit. So the reason why I put up this right here concerning the September 11 attack is because look how close in years that happened. And yet information is changed already. Look how close years that happened. When did this happen? 2001? 2001. And look how close information changed in the in matter of those years. So it doesn't matter how close it is, information could change just like that. Now when you're in now in, in, in your children's social studies book, they're gonna tell you that it was a set of Arabs with credit cards taking over the plane changed history, and knowing that it was not so, and that this was a government plan. So again, I'm just showing this information here to show y'all how easy information could change and how stories could pass down and, and stories could change by just a, a blink of an eye. You guys follow that? So let's go into the evidence that I'll show who is the beloved of Christ. Now, all y'all new people and even, even now, I want y'all to write these evidence down because I'm going to ask y'all questions. We're going to evidence one now. Lazarus is dead. So let's go to St. John chapter 11, verse 1 to 27. It's the book of St. John's chapter 11, starting at verse 1. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. Mm -hmm. it so Lazarus, there's a family, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, brothers and sisters, right? Let's continue. It was that Mary, which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Keep that in mind as well, too, right? Why did he bring it up so early? Keep that in mind. Write that down as well, that this same person, this, the, is Mary is the one who wiped our feet with a hair. All right? Let's continue. Verse 3. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. So his sisters sent the information saying, Lord, behold, whom thou hast loveth is sick. Talking about Lazarus. But somebody would say, hey, Christ loves everybody. What's the big deal? That doesn't show enough information. Let's continue. Verse 4. When Yeshia heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but the glory of the Most High, that the Son of the Most High might be glorified thereby. Mm -hmm. Now Yeshia loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So it says that Christ loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. He loved this family here. This particular family, he had something like, man, I really, 
care about this family. Something about them. So he says, Yeshia loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. Right? Continue. Verse 6. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Mm -hmm. Then after that, saith he to his, to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. So again, now, after Christ heard that Lazarus was sick, he stood there even two more days. Because he wanted to show something here, right? So then he offered that, he said, then, then after that he saved unto the disciples, let us go unto the Judea again, all right? Continue. This is verse 8. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Mm -hmm. Yeshia answered, Are there not twelve hours in a day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. So, right. So, when the disciples came about and asked Christ, Now, listen, you want to go? You want to go? To a place where everybody wants to kill you and stone you? Why you want to go there again? We're, we're hiding. What's the, what's the, why are you going out there to trying to get killed? Christ answered and said, Are there not twelve hours in a day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of the world. So he's saying, Okay, in the daytime, everybody can see everything. Everybody can see who's walking, everybody can see your face. So that it's easy for them to not stumble. It's easy for them to see you. All right, continue. Verse 10. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth because there is no light in him. So, but he's saying, but if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth because there is no light in him. So listen to what he's, listen to what he's telling the disciple. He said, like, listen, if you read what Christ is actually saying there, he says, we're going to walk in the nighttime. Because these guys are of the dark. They can't see anything. They won't able to, to spot us out. So we're going to walk in the night. We have light in us. We can see through the night. You guys follow that? Continue. This is verse 11. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. So Christ said to his disciples, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that, may, that I may awake him out of sleep. Continue. This, this is verse 12. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. So, right, so anybody sleeping, they're gonna, he's doing well. He's getting his rest, he's getting his strength back. So the disciples said, Lord, if he's sleeping, he's doing good. What's the big deal? All right, continue. Howbeit, Yeshia spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Mm -hmm. Then said Yeshia unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. All right, continue. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, to the intent ye may be believed. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Mm -hmm. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us, go also, let us also go, that we may die with him. So right. So again, I tell people always all the time, with Thomas' mindset, mindset Thomas in this, in this point right here is lacking faith. water. Thomas. Thomas. Thomas is here is lacking faith. 
This is a struggle. So he's, what he's saying right now, he's saying, listen, if we're going to, this guy's going to get himself killed. So let's go and let's all get killed with him. Right? <laughs> so you're going to see in the, in the Gospel of John, you see the, the nakedness of the disciples, their struggles. Right? So, so now Thomas is saying, let's, let's all go out there and get killed with him. All right, verse 17. Verse 17. Then when Yeshua came, he found that he had lain in the grave for four days already. So, this is, this is, this type of thing is different than any other thing Christ was dealing with. Based on what we read. Lazarus is dead for four days. Four days, guys. That's a dead man. Body's cold and everything. Four days. Keep that in mind. Continue. Verse 18. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. Uh -huh. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary. So keep that in mind as well. Why did they bring up Bethany is far from Jerusalem? And why is it that many Jews are coming to see this particular guy? Keep that in mind. Write these things down, guys. Come, I saw some questions. So it says, many of the Jews came to see Martha and Mary. So these people are well-known people. Coming from Jerusalem to Bethany. Continue. To comfort them concerning their brother. To comfort them concerning their brother. Continue. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Yeshia was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. So Martha heard that Christ was coming, so she went and met him in front of the town. But he said that Mary stood in, inside the house. Continue. Then said Martha unto Yeshia, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. So Martha says, Lord, if you were here, I know my, my brother wouldn't have died. If you were only here on time, why did it take so long? If he was here, I know he wouldn't have died. Right? Continue. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of the Most High, the Most High will give it thee. So Martha said, but I know, even now, after four days of death, Whatsoever thou wilt ask the Most High, the Most High will give thee. Continue. This is verse 23. Yeshia saith unto her, thy brother shall rise again. So hear this. Remember, he's dead for four days. Christ tells Martha, Your, thy brother shall rise again. Again, keep that in mind. Continue. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So Martha says, tells Christ now, listen, I know that he shall rise again on the day of the resurrection. She's like, yeah, I, I know about this stuff. Christ, you want to tell me this. I know he's going to rise again. But she's not thinking about now. She's thinking about it in the time of judgment. So she's like, yeah, I, I know that. I'm not worried about that. I'm talking about now. Continue. Verse 25. Yeshia saith, said unto her, I am the resurrection. Christ said, listen, you're standing in front of the resurrection. I am the resurrection. What are you talking about waiting? I'm here right now. Christ said, I am the resurrection. Keep that in mind. Again, write that down. Yeshua said unto her, I am the resurrection. Continue. And the life. And the life. Continue. He that believeth in me. He that believeth in me. Continue. Though he were dead. Though he were dead. Yet shall he live. Yet shall 
he lived. Keep that in mind, guys. Keep that in mind. In, in mind. Though he were dead, yet shall he live. Continue. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Keep that in mind again. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Keep that in mind again. Continue. Believeth thou this? Do you believe this, Martha? Do you hear what I'm telling you, Martha? I am the resurrection. Anyone who is dead and believing on me shall live. Do you believe this? What was her answer? Continue. She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of the Most High, which should come into the world. So she says, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Son of the Most High, and you have come into this world, and I shall believe on you and your words. All right, chapter 11, verse 28 to 44. Let's read that. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The master is come and calleth for thee. Mm -hmm. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. So, right, so as soon as Martha came to the house and said, The Lord is looking for you, she got up quickly and started running. So she rose quickly and came on to him. Continue. Now Yeshia was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. So right, so again, remember, towns that usually have gates. So he was outside of the gate before he entered inside the town. So he was staying outside of the gate of the town. All right? So she said he, um, she was going to meet him where, where Martha had met him, right? Continue. The Jews then, which were in the were with her in the house and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, "She goeth unto the grave to weep there." Right. So now, all people, there's a lot of people there, and they're seeing Mary getting up, and they're like, "Where's she going? She's probably going to go to the grave and, and, and mourn." All right. Continue. Then when Mary was come where Yeshia was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. And I want to I say this as well, too, as well. Notice that she, they said that she went to the grave to go and mourn. It's not a bad thing. You understand what I'm saying? You had the people decorating David's tomb for crying out loud. So, right? So don't make this a thing or superstition. Right? People do went to graves and to mourn. Guys, follow that. Verse 33. When Yeshia therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. So when Mary said, Lord, if you were here, said it a second time after Martha said it. Now she's saying, Lord, if you were here, my brother would have died. And when, when, Yishai, when Yishai therefore saw her weeping, saw her crying, and the Jews weeping with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. The reason why he was groaning in the spirit and was troubled, he's like, where is these people faith? I'm not here to cause, he's like, I'm not here to cause sorrow. So he was troubled in the spirit, like, man. Continue. Verse 34, and said, where have ye laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Yeshia wept. So it says, and, and it said, where have, so Christ said, where have you laid him? And they said, come and see. And Yeshia wept. Again, this is his friend here. This is people that he loves here. And they're, 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 they're crying and weeping. So it's naturally for somebody to feel, the, uh, and wants to comfort people and feel like, man, I don't want these people to <laughs> be in tears. So even Christ wept, right? Continue. This is 30. 
This is verse 36. Then said the Jews, the Jews, behold how he loved him. Look what the Jews said now. Even the Jews themselves who came and come and visit said, look how much Christ loved this man. That he's crying. Keep that in mind. Continue. And some of them said, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? So now they even, they're still, they're still a murmur like, man, if he was only here, like why, why, he didn't, why he didn't do anything? Continue. Verse 38. Yeshia therefore, again, groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. So right, again, because people are telling him like, man, you could have done something. Why you didn't do anything? Right? Continue. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Yeshia said, take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh. For he had been dead for four days. The body is already rotten already. It stinks. You open up there, it stinks because the body is decaying already. Nothing ever seems, nobody ever seen something like this. What Christ is about to do. You're talking about a decaying body. In the grave for four days. Continue. Yeshia saith unto her, said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of the Most High? So again, showing that Martha was still thinking about the future. She's like, yeah, Lord, I believe all that. But now, for, like, you said in the, judge, in the time of judgment that the body shall rise. Why wouldn't he want to open up a grave right now? He's, he's been dead for four days. And Christ had to remind her, didn't I tell you? If thou believeth, thou shalt shall see the glory of the Most High. If thou believeth, thou shalt see the glory of the Most High. And that's key right there, brothers and sisters, once again. Just because, again, you stop eating pork, you stop doing these certain things, doesn't mean that you're able to see the most high. It says believing. Believing means not having no lack of faith. Mm -hmm. Knowing that these things will, can, and will happen. This is what he's telling her here. Continue. Verse 41. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Yeshia lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I, and I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he, and when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus. Come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Yeshia said unto him, Loose him and let him go. Just to show you there, and if it be the most I will, how that's going to happen. If it be the Father's will that some of us have to fall asleep. That everybody shall hear his voice and they know what's coming. So even in the grave, you shall hear his voice and say, and he's telling you, come forth. Rise, come forth. This is just a snippet of what's to come. So no, nobody has ever seen this. Ever. Yeah, somebody falls, um, falls sick, maybe a half an hour dead, four days? 
four days of body decaying and he's rising? And remember, there's a ton, ton of people here right now coming up from Jerusalem to see this, to come and help Mary and Martha out. So everybody's seeing this thing. This is now the talk of the town now. So now, Christ saying that he is the resurrection. And Christ saying that, and, and, and we read in the scripture that says that Christ is the first fruit of those who have risen. So what is, how is it that Christ is the first fruit that have risen and he's not the first to rise from the dead? So we're going to go into the scriptures why Christ is considered to be the first fruit, right? Of risen. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 50, 15, verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Okay, it says, now Christ is risen from the dead and became the first fruits of them that slept. But the last verse rose before him. How is it that he's the first fruit? We have to go into the law to see exactly what he's talking about. Let's read Exodus chapter 23, verse 19. The first of the first fruits of thy, of thy land thou shalt bring into the house of the Most High thy power. So that is the reason why Christ is considered the first fruit. Because when he rose, he presented himself to the Most High. He presented himself and said, this is the offering. This is me, my offering to you. And that's how he became the first fruit. Guys, follow that. All right, perfect. Evidence number two, the Bethusian family. And you can look this up online. It's all the evidence is there are concerning the Bethusian family. Right? So let's read that real quick. The Bethusians are believed to have been associated with the members of the highly priestly family, the Bothys. Mm -hmm. Simon, son of Bothys from Alexandria, was made a high priest from about 25 BCE by Herod the Great mm -hmm. in order that his marriage with Beothus' daughter, Miriam, might not be regarded as mesalliance, mm -hmm. a marriage which a person thought to be unsuitable or of a lower social position. Uh -huh. The family of Bothius produced the following high priest, Simon, son of Bothius, or Bothius himself, mm -hmm. Josiah, son of Bothius, Eleazar, son of Bothius, mm -hmm. Simon Cantheris, uh, mm -hmm. son of Bothius, Elonius, uh -huh. son of Simon Cantheris, mm -hmm. Joshua, son of Gamiel, whom the wife Martha belonged to the house. Okay, hold, stop that right there. Click the button right there again, brother. Go forward. Right. Keep on going. Keep on going. Keep on going. All right. I want you to pay attention to the names here concerning the Bethusian family. You have this man here, the first arrow there, Simon, who's the father of these, of these people, right? Simon. Keep that in mind. Write that down. Simon. Then you have somebody named Miriam, who name is was short for Mary, right? And then you have a man, then you have a person named Eleazar. In the Greek, who they call Lazarus. Because this is all history here. This is not no fairy tales. All this history is here about these people. Another word for Lazarus, in the Hebrew is Eleazar. And Eleazar was a high priest before. And not only that, you have Martha. Martha. So you have these names here. Simon, Miriam, Martha, and Eleazar, a.k.a. Lazarus, all in this family of the Bethusian family. So that will make it even, have even more sense now why people travel all the way from Jerusalem to Bethany. 
to come see the death of Lazarus. Because these, 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 this family right here is well-known people. His father was a high priest. Eliezer was a high priest. And then you have the sister Martha and Miriam. And now, check this out, guys. The dialect on that Bethusian goes back to family of the Essenes. Family of the Essenes. Keep that in mind. So again, keep this, this name in mind. Simon, Eliezer, which you know, Martha, Miriam. But keep that name Simon in mind. Simon is the father of these, these people. Eliezer, Martha, and Miriam. Keep that in mind. Evidence number three. Who let her in? Let's go to St. Luke chapter 7, verse 36 to 50. The book, the book of Luke chapter 7. The book of Luke chapter 7, verse 36. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. So a Pharisee wanted to show hospitality to Christ, but he, let it, but he brought him in Christ into his house and made him a meal. Right? They sat down and they ate. So this is in somebody's house. Come. Keep that in mind. Continue. Verse 37. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Yeshua sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. Right, so behold, a woman in the city who, which was a sinner, knew that Christ was inside this house. Right? Inside this, this, this Pharisee's house. And brought an alabaster box of ointment. And we know, based on the scripture, that the, the, this, ointment, this, this ointment in an alabaster box is precious and very expensive. So this woman that, that's coming with this has money. And her for her to have money, she has to be in the upper class. Keep that in mind. Continue. This is verse 38. And stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and, the, and anointed them with the ointment. So, okay. Remember I told you to write this thing down. Concerning they said this about this woman named Mary. Who used her? Who wiped her hair? Wiped uh, wiped the shyest head with her hair. Right? Keep this in mind. Continue. This is verse thirty-nine. Now, when the Pharisee which had bitten which had bitten him and saw it, he spake within he spake within himself, saying, "This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman that this that this that toucheth him." For she is a sinner. So, now, the Pharisee seeing this in his house, seeing this woman come with an alabaster box, some ointment, and using her hair to, to wipe the tears off of Christ's feet. Not only that, he seen this and spoke to himself in his mind. Saying that if this man knew what kind of woman is this, he wouldn't allow her to touch her. He wouldn't allow him to, for her to touch him. Based off of the evidence, those who haven't seen it, I want new people to get this, um, this thing. Based off of the evidence that we had here, why would this Pharisee, this Pharisee who's on the law, be like, hey, this is all. Why would this Pharisee say in his mind that man, if this, if this man knew what kind of woman this was, he wouldn't allow her to touch it. He didn't say it to Christ, he said it in his mind. What would, what would make somebody not 
say something. A Pharisee now. We're talking about a Pharisee on the law. Boom, boom. On the law. Anybody? Raise your hand. That's a perfect answer right there. He knew her. That will stop a person from not saying anything. So in his mind, he's like, man, I know this person. And man, if he knew what kind of woman this was, he wouldn't allow her to touch him. He didn't mind. Continue. This is verse 40. And Yeshia answering said unto him, Simon. Who? Simon. Who? Simon. Let me just read in the Bethusian family mm-hmm. about a man named Simon who had children, Eleazar, Martha, and Mary. So a father, not going to talk so crazy about his daughter in front of guests. Not going to talk crazy in front of the guests. Damn, my daughter's a straight sinner, man. If he knew about this girl, he wouldn't allow her to, like, man, you don't understand. This, this sister's dealing with so many spirits. A father, a father wouldn't want you to make himself look bad. I'm going to make my family look bad in here. This is a guess. So it's easy for him to put it, keep that in his mind. If it was somebody else that came, check this out. Again, how did she get in? She lived there. <laughs> Fast seen ain't allowing nobody to come in their house unknown. Like, who, who are you? This is holy ground you're standing on. But if it's my daughter now, she lives in a room upstairs. So when she heard that he he was inside the house, she went and bought the alabaster box with the ointment. So Yeshia answered and said unto him, Simon, continue. I have somewhat to say unto thee. Uh Uh-huh. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors, one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them who will, who will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. Mm-hmm. And that they, and they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? Mm-hmm. And he said unto the woman, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. So again, not only that, you're talking about not only Christ and this man there, there's other guests there, maybe other Pharisees. So they're looking like, man, this, this guy touching this sister? Who is this man to forgive sins? So he tells this woman, and he said unto this woman, thy faith hath saved thee, go in peace. This is the next chapter now. St. Luke chapter 8, verse 1 to 3. Continue. And it came, and it came to pass afterwards... That he, w- that he went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of the Most High. And the twelve were with him. Mm-hmm. And certain women, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, called, Mary called Magdalene, after of whom went seven devils. So all of a sudden now, after that verse is done, he says, go in peace. Your sins have forgiven you. Chapter 8 now, he's not introducing Mary Magdalene. Showing, again, how he say that he's adding on disciples. 
Now, now all of a sudden, Mary, Mad- Mary Madeline now is introduced in the Gospel of Luke. And that she, that she is healed from evil spirits and infirmities. That's what he said. That's why Simon said, this woman's a sinner. Out of, of whom went seven devils. Continue. It's verse 3. And Joanna, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance. So look at that. Look at those set of people that got introduced now, these women who got introduced into the, to the ministry. All three of these women are well-known women of Israel. Joanna, the wife of Kuzar, of Kuzar Herod Stewart. Uh, Susanna, when you look at Susanna, she is married to one of the people inside uh, um, Herod's kingdom. So showing you again where, where the story is going, how, you, how, the, how these people got introduced. Maybe these women were there when this happened. And they've seen this. Right? Just showing you again who Christ was talking about who actually wiped her hair on, the, on his uh, feet. Right? You guys follow? Uh-huh. All right. So let's go to St. John chapter 12, verse 1 to 8. Verse 1. Then Yeshia, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was which he where Lazarus was which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. So right, six days before the Passover, Christ is in Bethany where Lazarus where Lazarus is from, right? Continue. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with so, him. So it says, so it's showing that where they ha- where they at? In Lazarus' house, right? It says, they made a supper and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat on the table with him, right? Mm-hmm. So as, as a guest, uh, as a person who's is, is, um, bringing for the guest, of course, the person who's, who um, house he belongs to is going to sit with them, right? Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him, right? Continue. Verse 3. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Yeshia and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of ointment. So, right. So, again, this spike knot is expensive ointment. And it's coming out from an alabaster box. So, again, showing how, how, how wealthy this family is. Right? Continue. Verse 4. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? So, right, so like, like Judas is looking at this and like, man, some, some, some expensive stuff. What are we doing rubbing feet with this? It's expensive stuff here. Why are we just don't, you know, take the money and, you know, split it up? Right, continue. This is verse 6. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. Right, so he, he didn't say it. He didn't say it because he, want, he really cared for the poor, that he wanted to put the money in the bag. Now he wanted the whole bag for himself. Because he was a thief. So he's like, man, like, even coming out your mouth, you might say, hey, this is what I want. But in your heart, you know that's not what you want to do with it. Right? But because he was a thief. Continue. And had the bag mm-hmm. and bear what was put therein. Right. So again, I tell people all the time, what was the reason for Christ doing that? Because again, Judas was a thief. Christ knew that he was a thief. But Christ still made him the treasurer of his own ministry. Why would, why would Christ do that? Because again, it is written even in, in the epistles and the gospel. If a, man, if a man is a thief, let him work with his hands. The good works are the most high. So what Christ is trying to do is make him convert his mind to do good. That's the reason why he made him a treasurer. Right? He said he had the bag and bear what was in there. Right? Continue. Verse 7. Then said Yeshia, let her alone. Against the day of my burying has she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. Right. All right, evidence number four. 
Simon the leper's house. Let's read Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 26, verse 1 to 10. And it came to pass, when Yeshua had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover. All right, so it says after two days is the feast of, feast of the Passover. So it says that within the six days, where were they? Where, where was Christ and his disciples at? Bethany. Where who? Uh, with Lazarus, right? With Martha. And Martha was serving. And Lazarus was sitting with them. So after these two days is the feast of Passover. So you know within that six days that where he's at. He's in Bethany. Guys follow? Hello? All right. So after two days is the feast of Passover. So, Christ, so he's in He's in Bethany with Lazarus in them, right? Keep that in mind. Continue. And the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. This, I mean, then assemble together the chief, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and consulted that they might take Yeshia by subtlety and kill him. Continue. But they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. Uh -huh. Now when Yeshua was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. In the house of where? Simon the leper. Simon the leper. Here comes Simon again, showing who house it was, where they were staying at. And Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Simon name comes up again. Showing you that they're inside their father's house. Continue. This is verse 7. There came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head mm -hmm. as he sat at meat. Mm -hmm. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much more and given to the poor. Mm -hmm. When Yeshua understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she has wrought a good work upon me. So just showing you here, like what the gospel is doing here, right? It's showing the perspective on both sides. What, what Judas was actually doing there. He was not really just ask, only asking Christ that question. He was trying to put it in everybody's mind. Like, hey, yo, why, why are you doing this? Why, why, we just, why we just don't sell to the poor? So the other disciples would be like, yeah, why, why not? That's how devils work. So he was trying to make, so trying to make a, a, a crew of people to be like, hey, like, yeah, why, Christ, why are we doing this? Right? So again, they were in Simon the leper's house. And we see in the, in the, in the, in the Gospel of John, that the Martha and Lazarus was there. Guys, follow? All right. All right, Mark chapter 14, verse 3 to 8. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. Continue. As he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious, and she break the box and poured it on his head. Which we know is Mary Madeline. Continue. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of ointment made? Mm -hmm. For it, may, it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. See that? Mm -hmm. Showing you again that what, what, what Judas was doing there was causing them to... to to, to stumble. Put him in a snare. Like, yo, yo, why, why are you doing that? He's talking, he's talking to Christ, but yet he's trying, to, he's trying to maneuver to get the disciples to murmur as well, too. That's why Christ had to convert them. Like, let, him, let her alone. That's none of your business. You got the poor always. You can get another spike nor then get, 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 um, and sell it again. Right? Continue. This is verse 6. And Yeshua said, 
Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always, and whensoever ye will, ye may do them good. But me ye have not always. She has done what she could. She has come aforehand and anoint my body to the burying. All right. Let's go to Luke chapter 10, verse 38 to 42. Now it came to pass, as they went, that he entered into a certain village. And a certain woman named Martha received, received him into her house. See that? So a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. Continue. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Yeshua's feet and heard his word. So again, so Mary, Mary was... A, was one of those students, like, again, sitting down, always listening to the word of, of, of the Messiah, right? Continue. This is verse 40. But Martha, Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. And Yeshia so answered. She, so Martha, Martha was complaining, like, man, she's over there busting up behind in the house serving food, and Martha's, Mary's just sitting down just listening to Christ. So Martha had a problem with that. Martha's like, Lord, like, don't, can you tell this, tell my sister to come and help me? Like, why, why is she just sitting down here and listening to you? All right, continue. And Yeshua answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. So he's like, Martha, Martha, calm down, relax. Anxiety is causing you not to see the will of the Most High. You trouble about way too much things for no reason. You have, tr you have trouble in your mind for way too much reason. Thou art ca careful and troubled about many things. Continue. But one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. So, but one thing is needful, and Mary have chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. She has taken the part of worrying about the will of the Messiah, the will of the Most High, and she has, and that part which we talk about the, concerning the precious ointment, all these things, her name is going to be remembered. Right? Let's go to St. John chapter 13, verse 1 to 2. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Yeshua knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Mm -hmm. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So now, Christ says that, look what the word says, he says that, Having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them all the way up to the end. That's key. That is key, guys. So remember we talked about all that in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 24. About betraying and all that stuff. Love all the way to the end. Then ye shall be saved. Got to follow all the steps of Christ, even all to the end, when chaos is going on. Even when your life is dependent on it now. It's life and death. That somebody's about to betray you and kill you all the way to the end. And supper being at end, the devil having now put in the, in the heart of Judas Scarlet, Simon's son, to betray Christ. So again, the devil now enters into Judas, gives him a, a doorway because that ointment was the doorway. Judas had now, I mean, again, still the will of the Most High had to happen. But again, for us, for example, how life works for us, we have options. Now, the devil could come and tell us, use our weakness, and say, hey, do this. We have an option to say yes or no. Judas himself, when, when the devil put in his heart about the ointment, he said yes. 
it should be done. And that was the opening and the, go, and the gate for the devil to come in now and be, and for, for, for your body, for the, for you could utilize your body now. All right? Let's go to St. John chapter 13, verse 21 and 30. All right, this is the book of John, chapter 13, verse 21. When Yeshua had thus said, he was troubled in the spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Mm -hmm. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. So again, Christ is saying now, one, telling his disciples on his table, like, listen, one of y'all going to betray me. And they're looking at everybody, including um, including. Uh, Judas, and be like, nah, it can't be him. It might be me. Peter, like, man, I got something. I got something I'm dealing with right now. Maybe it could be me. I'm probably dealing with anger. Thomas saying, maybe I'm mad. I'm, I'm lacking faith. Maybe it could be me. Surely, surely it can't be Judas. Right? Continue. Verse 23. Now there was leaning on Yeshua's bosom one of his disciples, whom Yeshua loved. So now, while they're going about saying, hey, Christ saying somebody's going to betray him. Now his disciple goes, uh, one of his disciples who he loved, lean on his bosom. So he's sitting right next to him. Sitting right next to him. Right here, man. Right? So the one, the, the one lean on his bosom of, of disciples whom Yeshua loved. Continue. Verse 24. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. So some people even say, hey, it could be Peter who Christ loved because he's sitting right next to him. He's asking the question. But again, Christ has two sides. So there's one guy sitting right next to Christ and Peter sitting right next to Christ. So the one leaning on his bosom, like, like, Lord, what's going on? And then Peter, Peter on his other end, like, hey, Lord, like, who, who is it? You got to tell me who it is. I'll kill him right now. But you know, you know, you know, Peter got the shank on him. Like, listen, you tell me right now, who is it? Right? So it says, St. Peter beckoned onto him that he should ask who is it who it should be. Whom he spake. Continue. Verse 25. He, then lying on Yeshua's breast, saith unto him, Lord, who is it? So, so the one now is on the, on the side of him, laying on Christ's breast, like, Lord, like, you got to tell me who this is. Tell me who it is. Continue. Yeshua answered. So Yeshua answered. Did he answer to everybody? No. He answered to one person and one person only, the one who was laying on his breast. So Yeshua answered now, continue. He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. So now the one who leaned on the bosom, Christ leans on the side like, yo, let me tell you something. Is the one who leaned on, the one who I dipped the, the sop to and give to, that's him. Everybody's still going crazy. Like, yo, what are you talking about? Like, who could it be? Yeah, it got to be him. That got to be me. No, it got to be that guy. <laughs> Why does all the, everybody's arguing? He's whispering to this guy on his bosom. Like, listen, let me tell you something. Who I, did my, who I give the stop to, that's who's going to be. Right? Continue. When I have dipped it, and when he had, he had dipped the sop, he gave it. To Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. So, when this is happening, everybody's arguing, like, who is it? Who could it be? And Peter's still crying, like, yo, Christ, you got to tell me. And he's saying to this guy, whoever dips their hand in the sop and I give to them, that's who's going to betray me. And when the person who was laying on the bosom saw he's like, oh, snap, it's, Lazarus, it's, it's, um, it's Judas. It's like, he's like, wow, I cannot believe it. It is Judas. Because that's what, that, that used to bother my mind all the time. Because I tried to figure out, like, Christ said it. Like, how did he know? But he didn't tell anybody. Everybody. He told one person outside of the 12. 
shown again why it cannot be John. Which I'm going to prove as well. So he tells this person to lean on the bosom, like whoever dips the, the hand of the sock, and wants to get the sock to, that is the, that is the person. And when he, dipped the, or when he dipped the sock, he gave it to the, Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Continue. Verse 27. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Yeshia unto him, that thou doest, doest, do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. So you see that? So, this, so when, as soon as they gave the sop, Satan answered that person, and all Christ said out loud to that to, to Jews, like, yo, whatever you got to do, go do it quickly. And it says, now no man at the table knew what intent he spake this unto him, because they didn't know about what Christ just said, mm -hmm. about the dipping in the sock. So they had no idea why Judas was leaving, except one person. Continue. Verse 29. For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag that Yeshia had said unto him, buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So right. So everybody's thinking when Christ said, when Christ telling Judas, go and do us quickly, they're thinking like, hey, he's going, going out to go feed the poor. Or he's going to get something for the feast. So nobody had no idea what was going on except one person, the beloved of Christ. Just the beloved of Christ. And again, people try to rewrite history and make fake paintings and stuff like that. Of the uh, of uh, the Last Supper, what's the name of is got Michelangelo that made that? Michelangelo. Notice on that picture, there's 13 people there. Who? Leonardo da Vinci. Excuse me. Thank you. Leonardo da Vinci. It's 13 people on that table, and the one who's leaning on his bosom. Somebody's saying people are saying that's Mary Madeline. That's incorrect. Right. So nobody know what, what Jews went down there for. Everybody thought that he was going out there to feed the poor or get something for the feast. All right? Continue. Verse 30. He then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. And it, it, he went, immediately went out, and it was night. All right? Evidence, evidence number five. Was only the twelve at the feast. Let's see if there's only twelve at the feast. Let's go to uh, Mark chapter 14, verse 17 to 20, and then we're going to jump to 51 to 52. All right, starting at verse 17. And in the evening he cometh with the twelve, and as they sat and did eat, Yeshua said, Verily I say unto you, one of you which eateth with me shall betray me. It says, one of you which eateth with me shall betray me. Continue. And they began to be sorrowful, and to say unto him one by one, is it I? And another said, is it I? So everybody's pointing at themselves like, Lord, could it be me? Please let me know. Right? Continue. And he answered and said unto them, it is one of the twelve that dippeth with me in the dish. See that? It is one of the twelve showing you again. That it couldn't be John. It's one of the twelve. So look at that. So that's showing you that he's telling somebody that is one of the twelve. So it cannot, so again, showing you again that there's more than one, uh, more people than, than the twelve disciples. Remember, there's seven, 70 of them so far right now. It's a feast for them. But his main, main group is apostles. They all sitting on the table with him, including his beloved friend. Read verse 20 again. Verse 20. And he answered and said unto them, It is one of the twelve that dippeth with me in the dish. 
Mm -hmm. And there followed him a certain young man having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young men laid hold on him. So right, so um, we jump down to verse 51. When Christ was in the, in the, uh, in the, in the, um, my olives, right, in the garden. When they tried to catch him, a certain young man left, um, left it and ran. And left his, left his, uh, his rap uh, um, with them, showing that there was more than one person there than, this, than, the, than the 12. Continue. This is verse 52. And he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Right. So showing again that there were more than, one, more than the 12 at the feast. Right? And I, and I say this all the time. Even though the Gospel of John was the last they, they, uh, according to scholars, that the Gospel of John is the last Gospel written, I believe the person that uh, who's an, uh, who is the, uh, the author of the Gospel of John, he is the scribe of Christ, or was the scribe of Christ. Of Christ. He's the one who was following all the disciples around and writing all things down. What you're going to see. Why well, I believe that. Right? Because a lot of things that happen is impossible for the disciples to, to know about that. Which is what we're going to see. Evidence number six. Known of the high priest. St. John chapter 18, verse 1 to 18. When Yeshia had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Sidron, where was a garden, into the which he entered and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Yeshia oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and torches and weapons. Mm -hmm. Yeshia therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? Mm -hmm. Verse 5. They answered him, Yeshia of Nazareth. Yeshia saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. <laughs> I love that, man. So as soon as, that, as, soon as they, he said, listen, I, I'm he, they all were scared, shook out of their mind and fell backwards. Right? Continue. Then asked he them again, whom seek ye? Mm -hmm. And they said, Yeshia of Nazareth. Yeshia answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way. Mm -hmm. That the saying might be fulfilled, which he spake of them which thou gavest me, have I lost none. Mm -hmm. This is verse 10. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. Uh -huh. The servant's name was Malchus. So again, there's two, there's two people in the Gospel of John. The author... And the narrator. The narrator is the one who's telling the story here. The author is the one who wrote it and gave it to the person to read and to narrate it. So the author now knows that the person that, that uh, Peter cut the air off was a high priest servant. Not only that he knew it was a high priest servant, his name is Malchus. For only somebody to know that they have to be up there to understand who these people are. Right? Continue. This is verse 12. Then the band and the captain of off and officers of the Jews took Yeshia and abound him and led him away to Annas first. For he was father in law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Mm hmm. Verse 14, now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews 
that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And Simon Peter followed Yeshia, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest. Check this out. So now, Simon, people, Simon Peter followed Yeshia, and so did the another disciple, unknown now. You got the beloved and the another disciple, unknown. That, that disciple was known unto the high priest. Right? This person was known of the high priest. Why would you think this person would be known of the high priest? Unless he's part of that family or that lineage. Because remember, we read that Eleazar came out from the lineage of high priests through the, through the Bethusian family. Right? And he was known of the high priest. Continue. He was known unto the high priest and went in with Yeshia into the palace of the high priest. And he went into Yeshia into the place of the high priest. So now this person just walked in. No problem. No question. No problem. No who are you? What family are you from? This guy just walks in. Continue. Verse 16. But Peter stood at the door without. So Peter now, brother, I don't know who you are. Stay outside. Peter's a nobody, according to them. He has to stay outside. But this guy now is one known the high priest, so he walks in. Remember, the set of people, everybody knew who Lazarus was. They came out from Jerusalem to come and see his, come to his funeral. So now this, this person who's known as the high priest walks in, no problem, continue. Then went out that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door and brought in Peter. So now, he, so Peter, he can't go about it and saw the, 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 the other disciple now has to go about like, yo, let my man in. He's like, and then the person says, all right, cool. And he walks in. But this person is well known. He knows who the servant is. He knows his name is Malchus. And now he's talking to somebody at the door. And asking, and asking hey, could you let him in? Right? Continue. Verse 17. Then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, art not thou also one of this man's disciples? He saith, I am not. Mm -hmm. And the servants and officers stood there, whom had made a fire of coals, for it was cold. And they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Right? So let's go to St. John, chapter 19, verse 6 to 9. So again, we see all the evidence here that this person, is known, this disciple is known as the high priest. This, this, this one is the beloved of Christ, lean on the bosom. All these things are there. So we have all these evidence here. Keep that in mind. St. John chapter 19, verse 6 to 9. When the chief priests, therefore, and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said, saith unto them, Take ye him, and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Mm -hmm. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law we ought to he, he ought to die, because he made himself the son of the Most High. Mm-hmm. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was, the, he was more afraid and went again into the judgment hall and saith unto Yeshia, Whence art thou? But Yeshia gave him no answer. Mm -hmm. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speaketh thou not unto me? No, knowest, that not, knowest thou not that I have the power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? Mm -hmm. Yeshia answered, Thou couldst have had no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivereth me unto thee has the greatest sin. Hold on. Let's go back. Go back. All right, go to the next slide. All right, let's go. 
Let's go to uh, Shawan, what you got there? Um, St. John chapter 19, verse 25, next. John. All right, so let's go to St. John chapter 19, verse 25 to 27. Now there stood by the cross of Yeshia, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. Right, so now, we have now Christ being crucified, and here comes uh, Yeshia's um, mother standing by the cross, and his mother's sister, and Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. Right? Continue. Verse 26, when Yeshia therefore saw his mother and a disciple standing by, whom he loved. So he now Yeshia is, Yeshia is being crucified and he sees his mother and the, 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 beloved of, uh, the beloved of him standing next to her. He says what? He saith unto his mother, woman, behold thy son. So he, so he says, woman, behold thy son. Continue. Then saith he to the, to the disciple, Behold thy mother. Behold thy mother. Continue. And from that hour, that disciple took her into his, ho his own home. So that hour, that, that disciple that Christ, that Christ loved, took Mary, his mother, into his house. Because remember, based on the evidence, we see that Joseph most likely passed away. Right? So, she, again, if Christ's going to be the firstborn, he's being crucified, which means the head. Right? The hour that disciple took her into his own home. Keep that in mind as well. Evidence 7. The 12 wasn't at the cross. The apostles were not at the cross. Let's go to St. John chapter 19, verse 31 to 42. Because remember, everybody's scattering right now. Christ's been taken away. Right? Let's read. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that, for that Sabbath day was a high day, mm -hmm. besought Pilate, that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. Verse 33. But when they came to Yeshia and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. All right. So again, the author saying that he's seen it. Now his legs were not broken. Continue. Verse 30, verse 34. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. So that the author now is saying, hey, I saw that the, 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 uh, the soldier stabbed Yeshia in the side, and out came blood and water. Continue. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true. See that? He said, he. Now the narrator is saying, he that saw it bear record. And his record is true. See that? Narrator, two people, narrator and author. Now the narrator is saying, I know what, this, what he's saying is true. That his record is true. That he has been pierced, he died, they didn't break his leg, he fulfilled that. And I'm showing you that his record is true, that Christ fulfilled these things. Right? Continue. And he knoweth that he saith true, mm -hmm. that he might believe. Uh -huh. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. So right, so it was shown that that, that person who, um, who saw Christ being crucified, because again, the 12 was not there. So this person now is saying, listen, I'm telling you by, by record that this is true. That this man, my bones were not broken. He was pierced to the side. Out came blood and water. He, he, he presented a drink offering. All that was done on there. Continue. Verse 37. And again, another scripture saith that they saith they shall look on him whom they pierced. Right. So the author saying that, listen, I seen that how he fulfilled that. He said, look upon him who will pierce. And again, his, all, none of his bones shall be broken. Right? Continue. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, 
being a disciple of Yeshia, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Yeshia. And Pilate gave him and Pilate gave him leave. And he came therefore and took the body of Yeshia. Right. So again, like for those who like come into this and they're famous, well known, they have they have no they have a right to be if they want us to keep the secret. They have a right to keep the secret. They shouldn't they sometimes is is not everything is for publicity. Certain people just need to be in the background and helping us out. Just like this man right here, Joseph. Because if, 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 if everybody knew that he was a disciple, he wouldn't have an opportunity to take down Christ's body. So if somebody, if somebody who's famous knows this, it's, it's, it's best for them to just keep it on the low and work in the background and help us out by maneuvering. Right? Continue. Verse 39. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Yeshia by sight and bought a mixture of myrrh and aloes and about a hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Yeshia and wound it in linen cloths with the spices mm -hmm. as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Right. So you see. The people that were there were well, only people that were there were well known people. Got, got Eliezer there, aka Lazarus, Mary, uh, Christ's mother Mary. You got Nicodemus. You got this guy Joseph, who's a well known man. So nobody's going to be touching these people. They're well known. You got, you got Mary, who's related to, uh, to uh, Elizabeth. Was, was, a, well, or was married to a high priest of Zechariah, they're not touching her. Everybody's good. But these little dudes from the hood, Pete and all them, nah, they got to run. The people that was there, they, they know that it cannot be touched. So they was there and, and observing that. Right? Continue. Verse 41. Now in the place where he was crucified... There was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, wherein was never man yet laid. Right, so this is a new sepulcher. They, they just built this thing. Nobody knows about the sepulcher here. Brand new. And they laid him there, right? Continue. There laid they, Yeshia, therefore, because of the Jews, preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. So right, the sepulcher is right there. So they say, you know what, let's utilize this, let's pay for this the sepulcher, and, and, and bury him here, right here. Right? All right, evidence number eight, to the tomb. Let's see, that, let's see what happens here. Let's go to John chapter 20, verse 1 to 10. The first, the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Uh -huh. Then she runneth, and cometh to uh, Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Yeshia loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. And the, re the reason why I highlighted that word we, because people will say, hey, the gospel is contradicting. Why is Mary by herself? Why is there, why is all, uh, in the other gospel saying three people were there? What's going on? It's crystal clear that it sa she says, we do not know where they laid her, where they laid him. Showing that they were just, just focused on Mary Madeline right here, but there's other people there with her, as the other gospels say. So they said, and we know that where they have not laid him. So she ran and told him, hey, we don't know where Christ's body is at. Right? Continue. Verse 3. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulchre. So right. So Peter and the other disciple now came to the sepulchre. Right, continue. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter. So right, so they, they both was running. When Mary Madeline heard this, both of them were running. But for some reason, the other disciple outran Peter. Listen, according to the scripture, Peter was a well-shaped guy. This guy's a fisherman. Pulling net, casting net, this guy's supposed to be in shape. 
how is it that this person is outrunning Peter? Based on the evidence that we just read, why would, why would this disciple outrun Peter? Those who haven't heard, um, haven't uh, answered yet about this thing. Anybody? Take a guess. On the resurrection, what else? Say again. He knew a shorter way to get there. You close. Who else? Relationship with Christ. Relationship with Christ. What else? He was dying to get there faster. Based off of the evidence, guys. We just, we just had the evidence there. Evidence number seven. Huh? He was there. Remember, the disciples weren't there. They don't know where the tomb is at. So Peter's running. He's like, hold up. I don't know where I'm going. He's running, and he's like, man, hold up. Where are we going? But the disciple who was there, who Christ said, behold, here's your mother, he knew exactly where the tomb was at. So he's running, and he outruns Peter because Peter has no idea where he's going. So it has, because you see a lot of things, people say that, oh, Peter was out of shape, he was older. Peter had no idea where he was going. The other disciple did outrun Peter. Continue. And came first to the sepulcher. Because remember, even though three day, these three days passed, remember, it was Shabbat, it was Passover, they can't go next to a tomb to be unclean. So he had no idea where this thing was at. Right? And, and came forth and came first into the sepulcher. So now, the other disciple now is at the sepulcher. He outran him and he's at the sepulcher, right? Continue. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. So he, check this out. So now, this, this disciple now Runs to the sepulchre, stoops low, but doesn't go in. He checks, he's trying to figure out what's going on, but he doesn't go in. Based off the evidence, why would this disciple not want to go in? He was a high priest. Remember, this guy was a high priest before. So according to the, the priest, he's going to follow the law. Shouldn't be next to a dead body. Want to stay pure. So he's going to stoop low and be like, Yo, everything cool in here? Want to make sure. He walks in and looks and says, you know what? I want to make sure the dead body's not in here first. Because I have to stay pure. The purification stays where I'm at in the week. Right? Continue. This is verse 6. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulchre. Well, Peter just pushed him out of the way and went in. He's from the hood. He don't care. You got time for that. Like, yo, get out of the way. Get out of the way. What's going on? Where, where's, the, where's the body at? Right? Continue. And see if the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a, in a place by itself. Right. So now, Peter goes in there, he checks, and checks the, the cloth and the things like, yo, what's going on? Where's the body? Right? Continue. Verse 8. Then went in also that other disciple. Then the other disciple went in. After he further out, the body wasn't there, he went in. Right? Continue. Which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. When he, he went to the sepulchre now, he goes in and he finds no body. He saw and he believed. Why would this disciple here saw, saw Christ's body not here and believe? But believe in what? Resurrection. Resurrection. Why? Who is this? Who was resurrected? 
Lazarus. Exactly. So evidence is proven that this person has to be Lazarus. Because him going in there, he's seeing, he's like, hold up. This happened to me before. I understand. I understand exactly what's going on here. So he goes in there and believes, and he says, yes, the Messiah has risen. Right? Continue. Verse 9, for as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So again, the disciples still, still didn't understand, but this particular disciple understood clearly what happened. The other disciples didn't understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Continue. Verse 10, then the disciples went away again unto their own home. So then the disciples went away into their home. The other disciple went home and understood crystal clear. Peter walked away, still like, I don't know what's going on. Like, somebody got to tell me exactly what's going on here. Evidence number nine. How shall he die? St. John chapter 21, verse 1 to 7, and then we're going to jump down to 15 to 25. This is verse 1. After these things, Yeshua showed himself again to the, disciple, to the disciples at the sea of Tiberias, and onto this wise showed he himself. There were, there were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee and two other of the disciples. So now... This is the second time Christ is going to um, show himself, because he might be showing himself after that, right? So this is the second time now he's showing them by the, by the, by the sea. And he said there were, there were uh, the disciples, some of the disciples there, including Peter, and two other disciples, right? Continue. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, we also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, that they might, that that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Yeshia stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Yeshia. So they, they, they saw somebody by the shore, but they didn't know who exactly who it was, right? Continue. Verse 5. Then Yeshia saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And, and he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship. And he shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Mm -hmm. Therefore, that disciple, who, that disciple whom Yeshia loved, saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now, when Simon. So now, the, remember, now, now the disciple, the beloved of, of, of Christ, is on the ship, and he says, That is the Lord. All right? Continue. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he grit his fisher's coat, he gird his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea. So I just want to put that out there. He was not butt naked. Again, when, when, when people fish and stuff like that, they have the wrap around their waist and they, they take up the coat, right? So when, he, when he's working, he took off the jacket and he just has the wrap around here. So that's when, he, when somebody doesn't have a covering on top, they call, consider that to be naked, all right? All right, verse 15. So when they had dined, Yeshua saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, loveth thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my sheep. Mm -hmm. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, loveth thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? So why, why did Christ do that? That he said to say that three times? He denied him three times. 
And this is what he said, that he, he said that, that the devil who wants you. He wants you, but uh, when the time when you'll be converted, when the time you'll be converted, um, convert back your, your brothers as well too. So what Christ is doing is he's converted him back and repents in his mind that he could think clearly now because that, that's on his, on his heart and on his mind. So Christ is now converting his mind now to come back and say, listen, don't worry about that. Feed my sheep. Because again, out of Christ's own mouth, he says that anybody who denies me, I deny in front of the Most High. And he has to keep that word. But Christ said, but Christ, what Christ is doing here, he's trying to, he's, he's trying to convert um, Peter's mind and give him grace that he's able to do, um, able to not be part of that. Right? Continue. And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Yeshua saith unto him, feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest that thou wouldest, but when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. So read verse 18 again. Verse 18, verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walketh whither thou wouldest. So right, so Christ telling uh, Peter, listen, telling Peter, like, listen, how he's going to die, right? He's saying, listen, when he was young, you was able to girt yourself which is by yourself, no problem, right? Continue. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. So right, so he says that he's going to be in an in a, in a old elder state, and people are going people to grab him, and, and, he's, and places that he would, would not, and, and try to kill him. That's pretty much what he's going to say, that he's going to die that way. In an old state, he's not going to be able to run, he's not going to be able to fight, you will die this way, right? He's telling Peter that, right? So there's a lot of work for him to do. Right, so another thing I want to say about this as well, too, when you look at these words, when it, the, the different words, love is down me, love is down me, love is down me. Even look in the Greek as well, too, you're going to see that he's going to say, he's going to ask him, love is down me, and he's going to ask him about, by speech. And the last one, he's going to say, agape. Unconditional. Love is down me unconditionally. And that's when Peter, like, man, like, Lord, you know all things. I would. I, 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 I love you. Right? But, um, so, so Christ is telling Peter now, okay, this is how you're going to die, right? In the old state, somebody's going to gird you up and carry you where, where you not would not go, right? Where you would not want to go. Right? Continue. Verse 19. This spake he, signifying by what, de by what death he, he should glorify the Most High. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, follow me. Mm -hmm. Verse 20. Then Peter, turning about, see if the disciple whom Yeshia loved, following. So now the disciple, while Christ is talking to, the, to, to Peter, somebody's behind them, walking behind them while they're talking. So then Peter, turning around, see the disciple who Yeshua loved and following. Right? Continue. Which also leaned on his breast at supper and who, said, uh -huh. Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? So this is the same person, right? Who Yeshua loved. Right? Continue. Verse 21. Peter seeing him saith to Yeshua, Lord, and what shall this man do? Right. So now, now Peter looks behind him and he see this guy following him, and he's saying, Lord, like, what should we do with this guy? Right? Continue. Verse 22. Yeshua saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. So now, this, so Christ tells him, like, listen, if I, want him to, if I want him to live until he come, until I come back, what is that to you? Follow thou me. Right? Continue. Verse 23. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that that, that disciple should not die. So it says, so it says that went round, um, this went around the, the brethren that this disciple not, that shall not die. So when Peter heard that, he's like, yo, you know what Christ told me? Like, yo, this man will die. Right? Continue. That that disciple should not die. Uh -huh. Yet Yeshua said not unto him, he shall not die, but... 
if I will that he tarry till I come, what is, what is that to thee? So it said, he says, but Yeshua did not say that he wouldn't die, but for some reason, the disciples of Peter himself, and when he went and told the disciples that this guy will not die, why would he think that? Because of, because of Christ's speech. Let's go back real quick. Let's go all the way back. I want to show you something. Go all the way back. Keep on going. So you want to stop. Right. Next, next slide. Next slide. Read, go back. Read verse 23 again, brother. Yeshia saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Yeshia saith unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, that though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever, whoever, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believeth thou this? So go back to the end now. So listen to what the words Christ is saying there. And the disciples hearing it, right? About the resurrection, this God, that, that whoever believeth in me shall never die. So they're like, man. The way how Christ is sounding, like this guy was not, not going not gonna to die. So obviously it's talking about Lazarus. Because anybody else, they, they, they wouldn't have to worry about what's going on with this guy. This guy just died. He was dead for four days. What are we going to do with this guy? What's going to happen to this guy? Because Christ has told him, like, hey, this is how you're going to die. So Peter's not asking like, yo, this guy already died already. Dead for four days. What are we going to do with him? Christ told him none of, none of your concern. Don't worry about it. If I want him to live until I come, who, what is that to you? You still got to do your job. Just showing again the multiple evidence with a shadow of doubt that the, the, beloved of this, or the beloved of Christ is indeed Lazarus. And again, the reason why it's called the Gospel of John, because the, God, the John is the, indeed the narrator, and Lazarus is the author of it. And again, I believe that Lazarus was the one writing down all things of what the disciples were doing and giving it these details so that way we can have the gospel of Matthew, the gospel of Mark, Luke, all these things without, without that scribe there, it would have been impossible to, for them to know certain things. Read verse 23 again. This is verse 23. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren, that the disciples should not die. Yet Yeshia said not unto him, he shall not die. But if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Mm -hmm. This is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. This is the disciple. Who is this disciple? The beloved. Who is the beloved, guys? Right, so we know that this disciple who is Lazarus was testified of these things and wrote these things. Continue. Verse 25. And there are also many other things which Yeshia did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world, even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. So the, all these, so there's plenty of things. That is not even written in the gospel what the Messiah did. In that span of life, from his testimony, or from, from his ministry. That the, the, that the narrator said that we can't even, it, it, the world cannot even hold 
what should be written about the Messiah. But again, there's so much, again, even with the gospel itself that we have, there's so much mystery, so much details that we could understand that there's so much to, to learn and to understand more about the gospel and the ministry and, and what is it about. All right? And we like to say, Aman, so let's get the most out of round of applause.